you come into Copenhagen, get with us, and then the Dutch Parliament for the Freedom Party. And the famous creator of the film, Fitter. I also want to thank Member of Parliament, the Danish Parliament, Søren Espersen, for having made it possible for the Free Press Society to use this August hall. Uh, and a thank you for all the people who have worked so hard to make this possible and to arrange, to arrange this day. I'm sorry that Member of Parliament, I've been visible. Uh, it's not among us today. Uh, I understand from his recent remarks yesterday on television that he has many opinions on Mr. Wilders and his film. And uh, if he had turned up today, he would have asked a few questions about this. He's chosen not to do so. Um, another person that is great missed, of course, is Prime Minister Alice Paul Washington, who also had many opinions. He was even so perspicacious that he was able to condemn the film before it had been shown. Uh, so, maybe he doesn't need to discuss anything. Uh, yesterday, I was asked by a TV reporter in Denmark, first of all, why we have invited Gilly Woods to come to Copenhagen, and secondly, why it should be here in this world. My answer was that we have not invited Mr. Woods because of his opinions. We have not invited him in order to endorse his interpretation, his views on Islam. You can have all kinds of views on Islam, including the Gay Woods' view. He's been invited here because he's persecuted for having spoken his mind, for having used the freedom of speech that is our birthright in Europe. That is why he is here today. Secondly, uh, we have put emphasis on using this hall because this is the home of our democracy. This is where our constitution is supposed to be upheld. This is where the constitution's paragraph on free speech should be protected more than in any other place in this country. That is why we are here. Regarding the arrangement today, uh, after giving the word to get builders, uh, we'll have a brief recess or break where people can have a drink or buy a book or go to the bathroom. 10 or 15 minutes later, we'll get back to this room and there'll be a possibility to ask questions and to discuss until approximately uh, 5 o'clock. And um, I'm sure there'll be plenty of opportunities to voice one's opinions and clear out all questions that one may have. So, once again, get with us, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very honored indeed to have been invited today by the Danish Free, Free Press Society to speak in the Danish Parliament, the heart of the Danish democracy. And my special thanks go to uh, Lars Hedegaard and Katrien Winkelhorn, who were so kind to invite me here and to help us with everything during our stay in Copenhagen. As you may all know, the title of my short film about the Quran and about Islam is Fitna. And Fitna is an Arabic word with many different meanings. The most common translation is ordeal or trial. And the name Fitna symbolizes, in my view, that Islam is the ordeal with which the free West is currently confronted. Are we prepared to defend our achievements, such as the equality of men and women, of heterosexuals and homosexuals as well, as the separation of church and state. I would like to throw some light today on the question of whether the Netherlands, but also the rest of Europe, will be able to face that ordeal, to face that fitna and stand the test. I will also address the question of why I made fitna and relate to some of you, to you, the reaction, some of the reactions I got 
during the process of making um, the movie and as well of my personal circumstances. And lastly, in my speech, I will offer you some thoughts on the future of freedom and democracy in Europe. Let me first try to explain to you why I made FIPA. It's an indisputable fact that the Netherlands and that Europe are in the process of being Islamized. For those who still might have some doubts whether this is actually the case, let me give you some figures about the Netherlands. A century ago, in 1909, there were 54 Muslims living in the Netherlands. In 1960, there were 1,399. In 1980, sorry, 1990, 485,000, and currently about 1 million. In France, approximately 10% of the populations are Muslims, and in total of Europe, not the European Union, but Europe, there are approximately 54 million Muslims living here. In less than half a century, the number of Muslims has increased considerably in practically all the countries of Europe. And within a few decades, the street scenes in Europe, particularly in the densely populated areas, have drastically changed. In countries such as my own, as the Netherlands, but also in Germany, perhaps also in Denmark, headscarves and burkas have now become slowly but steadily integrated and are part of our daily experience. However, the Islamization of Europe encompasses more than only that. It also affects, and that is even more important than just the numbers, it affects the European achievements of the last century. And it is sad to see that, for instance, the equality, the equality of men and women in Europe of 2008 is indeed under pressure. Take, for example, the rise in the number of Allah killings. Or take the attempts to introduce Sharia wills and testaments, where, which award women with half of what men receive. Of the refusal, more common in the Netherlands, by radical Muslims not to shake hands with women. The same applies to the equality, I thought I said it before, between homosexuals and heterosexuals. In Amsterdam, once the gay capital of the world, gay men of the day, on a daily basis, beaten up and a 95% by young Moroccans. And in trying to find an explanation for this Islamic intolerance, for this hatred, our whole way of life and to the West as such, some take the view that that must be the result of the prior European colonization of the Arab Muslim world. Others say, no, it's the American, British attack on Iraq or Saddam Hussein. Others say, no, it's the, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, or it's the poverty in the Muslim world. It's also an explanation you offer here. However, ladies and gentlemen, in my opinion, none of these factors really explains the issue. I am convinced that the explanation is Islam as such. The core of Islam is the 7th century Quran, as well as the life of the Prophet Muhammad. The Quran is indeed also very different from the Bible in that it contains commands and injunctions that are neither, neither place nor time bound. This means that the cause, for instance, for Muslims to kill non-Muslims, Surah 4, verse 89, and Surah 47, verse 4, or to terrorize non-Muslims, Surah 8, verse 60, what I used in my short film, as well as the duty to wage war, in other words, jihad, apply directly to Muslims today. And the same goes for the judgments on the Jews, which the Quran delivers up to three times, namely that they are monkey and pigs. And this is not a time bound either. It applies equally to 2008. And I have read the Quran and many different translations several times now and spoke about it with many people. And I came and I come every time again to the conclusion that the Quran calls for hatred, for violence, for submission, for murder and terrorism. And moreover, that is not confined to the seventh century either. Again and again, the conclusion is that the Quran, in fact, is a book of war, 
and that there is an inseparable connection between the Quran and the Islam as such and the atrocities committed by Muslims. And apart from the Quran, the life of the Prophet Muhammad plays a crucial part as well. Muhammad, as you might know, was indeed involved in a large number of bloody wars, anywhere between 25 and 30 of them. And Islamic tradition tells us how he fought those battles more in his Medina time of life than his Mecca time of life. But still, how he had enemies murdered and had prisoners of war and Jews executed. Muhammad ruled over Mecca and Medina and subsequently the entire Arabic Peninsula. But it's not only the past, ladies and gentlemen. Like the brave apostate Wafa Sultan, I hope you know Wafa Sultan, like she said, I quote her, the problem is that the Quran clearly says that Muhammad should be a role model for every Muslim. You are not allowed to criticize him, but you should follow in his footsteps. As a Muslim, it is your mission to spread Islam by the soul. End of quote. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, it's my belief that the Islam is more an ideology than a religion. It's a system that lays down rules and regulations for social, political life. Islamic law, the Sharia, not only legislates in criminal matters, but also, for example, in the areas of personal law or family law. And the Belgian professor of Islamic studies, Mr. Urbain Vermeule, once said that Islam is only 10% a religion and 90% an ideology. And he's right. Of course, there is nothing wrong with having an ideology. Take liberalism or other ideologies, for example. But an ideology is wrong if it is totalitarian. As a matter of fact, Islamic ideology shows striking similarities within this totalitarianism with communism and fascism. One could mention its anti-democratic character, the will to exercise total control over social life and the use the will and the eagerness to use violence to subject dissenters. In fact, the Islamic ideology is indeed totalitarian in character. <coughs> Islam, I believe, is not compatible with freedom, is not compatible with democracy. And of course, I want to emphasize that I'm not talking about the people, I'm not talking about all of the Muslims, I'm talking about the Islamic ideology. It's very important to make the difference between the two. I have warned against the dangers of the Quran and the Islam in numerous interviews in the Netherlands and abroad. I wrote opinion articles, speeches, and of course, many parliamentary debates in the Netherlands. But a single picture, a single short movie, often shows more than a thousand words. And that is why I decided last year to put my views on Islam and the Quran into a short film. The result is Fitna. <coughs> the premiered at the end of March. And without once again putting all Muslims into the same category, I'm not doing that, I hope I have succeeded in showing that the Quran is not some dusty old book, but that it's used today as a source of inspiration for and justification of hatred, violence, submission, and terrorism in the world. Not only far away, but also in Europe, in the Netherlands, and here today in Denmark. And that brings me, ladies and gentlemen, to the responses to Fitna in the Netherlands and other countries. It became known last year, November of last year, that I was working on a film about the Quran and the Islam. And from that day onwards, From that day, from last year, uh, November onwards, uh, the Netherlands, and especially, particularly its politicians, was in uproar. A prominent member of the Dutch Christian Democratic Party, the largest party, the government party in the Netherlands, said that I was an evil, personally, not a film, but I personally was evil, and I should be stopped. An extremely left-wing group tried to stage mass demonstrations 
against me, not a movie, and as to them. The spokesman for the Dutch branch of the Islamic organization, Hizbul Tahrir, cried out that the Netherlands was due for an attack. The Dutch Islamic organization even went to court trying to prevent and asked the judge to prevent Vietnam from being shown. Fortunately, this organization did not get its way. Significantly, not a single, unfortunately, not a single Dutch broadcasting organization, thank you very much, not a single Dutch broadcasting organization had indeed the courage to broadcast Vietnam in its entity. But the reactions, ladies and gentlemen, were not confined to the Netherlands. Outside the Netherlands, there was uproar um, as well. The Taliban threatened additional attacks against the Dutch troops in Afghanistan. A website linked to Al-Qaeda contained the message that I ought to be killed, while various movies from Syria and Jerusalem stated that I and nobody else would be responsible for all the bloodshed for after screening the film, and even the NATO's Secretary General, Mr. De Hoogschaffer, a very countryman of mine, was critical about Vietnam, all of them without having seen even one single second of the movie. The whole world almost an uproar, nobody saw it, nobody knew one second of the content of the movie, talking about freedom of speech. If any Criticism is uttered about Islam, unfortunately, it immediately meets with the most intolerant responses from the Islamic world. This is the reality. Whether it's Salman Rushdie's satanic verses, or the film submission by my friend Ayan Hirshi Ali and Theo van Gogh, or the Pope who quotes the Byzantine emperor about Islam, or your own Kurt Westergaard and his cartoons, or indeed my own film, Fitna. Many Muslims unfortunately, appear to be far more concerned about criticism towards their ideology or religion than about the heinous crimes committed in the name of Islam. Meanwhile, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands called me to abandon the film project. Still, there was no movie at that time. As did the chairman of the same political group in Parliament. And the Minister of Justice threatened me as well. He said, let it be known that if you show this movie, that we might file criminal proceedings to you. And you should be held responsible in a code of law. Even before, once again, ladies and gentlemen, before the film was shown. And that was also the opinion of the leader of the Dutch Labour Party, who is also a member of the Dutch cabinet. The government even made the state prosecutor, the state advocate, investigate the possibility of having FITNA banned in advance. The Dutch Prime Minister called also on other people, on the French President Sarkozy, and also, by the way, on your own Danish Prime Minister, to ask for assistance. And while letters were sent to all the Dutch municipalities stating that riots might occur after the screen of FITNA, where once again, Nobody saw one second of the movie. Police commanders in the Netherlands received a letter stating that the police, after Fitna was broadcasted, should register all legal complaints against me, regardless of the offense had been committed or not, just for social reasons. Everywhere in the country, mayors of towns and cities held emergency meetings on the impending screening of my film. And Dutch embassies in Islamic countries were requested to take precautionary measures and draw up evacuation plans. The Prime Minister even talked about a serious crisis and potential attacks. The Dutch government's reaction prior, very important, prior to the showing of the film undoubtedly created fear in the Dutch population. All because of a 15-minute film that had not even been shown up up to then. But even after the release of FITNA, the Dutch government continued the, sh the shocking behavior. On the evening when FITNA was screened, the Dutch Prime Minister muttered something in a brief statement about freedom of expression, followed by a long and a serious statement about offending and insulting citizens, and a statement to the effect that the Dutch government regretted the 
the existence and the showing of Firman. Prime Minister Wagner and the shoot, of course, undefendedly, unconditionally, I mean, and without any conditions, he would have, should have defended the freedom of speech. Instead, he chose to give in, act like a demon, to give in to Islamic and politically correct pressure. Fortunately, the reaction of Muslims in the Netherlands were in general more mature than the reaction of our own Prime Minister, and they deserve a compliment for that. Unfortunately, reactions in certain parts of the Islamic world were different. In Afghanistan and Pakistan, the Dutch flag was burnt on repeated occasions as well, by the way, as your own national flag, because of the Danish cartoons. And in addition, dolls depicting me were burnt. The Indonesian president, Jojo Hono, announced that I would never be able to set one foot into Indonesian soil. UN Secretary General Mr. Ban Ki-moon and also the European Union issued all cowardly statements in the same theme as made by the Dutch Prime Minister. I could go on because it went on and on. It was, ladies and gentlemen, before and after showing of the movie, an absolute disgrace. However, Fitna was a success. Within a few weeks, it was seen by almost 20 million people all over the world. And in making Fitna, I also tried to initiate an in-depth debate about the inherent dangers of Islam. And unfortunately, such a debate has mostly failed to materialize so far. The more so because all invitations on my part to have a debate with representatives of the Muslim communities and organizations, as well as the Imams and ordinary Muslims, was rejected. A few weeks after showing of the movie, I invited, in an evening with the press present, I invited six imams, three moderates, and three radical imams from Amsterdam, Rotterdam, the civil cities of the Netherlands. I invited them to come and debate with me in the presence of the press, and the all, all six of them rejected. I can only conclude that they really do not want a debate. Prior to the show of Fitna, in an article on the opinion pages of, the Dutch news, of a Dutch newspaper, I posed the question how the Dutch government would have reacted if I had not announced a film about the Quran and the Islam, but instead a film about the Bible and a film about Christianity. And the answer, of course, is obvious. Nothing, what I just all mentioned to you, nothing would have happened at all. The government would not have taken such a precautionary measures. There would not have been fear. There would not have been widespread riots. In the Netherlands, unfortunately, it's not Prime Minister Balkenende, but it's fear that is ruling our country. Fear of Islam. And that is still the case today. For example, our Minister of Justice announced more stringent measures against blasphemy. And recently, a Dutch cartoonist was arrested in a raid by no fewer than 10 policemen. A precedent as well as a boundary crossed. At least you protect your cartoonist we arrest him. This is the Netherlands in 2008. It seems like the former German Democratic Republic is being resurrected in the lower countries. In fact, it is not only Islam that will be our undoing, but also the whole concept of cultural relativism and self-censorship on part of the political correct elite. And let me give you one other telling example of the cultural relativism in the Netherlands. We have a Quran in our, I don't know how it's the case here in this building, but in our the Dutch Parliament, in our plenary hall, we have a Quran, but we don't have the Dutch flag. And I think that's a topsy turvy world. We should get rid of the Quran in our Parliament and bring in our national flag. Differently from what some of you might expect, my views on the Quran, of course, and Islam are not so original. I'm not the one who invented it, and I wouldn't take credit for that. No other. Then, for instance, Winston Churchill said, um, in the 19th century, even in 1898, he said, Mohammedism is a militant and a proselyting faith. No stronger retrograde force exists 
in the world. It has already spread throughout Central Africa, raising fearless warriors in every step. The civilization of modern Europe might fall as fell the civilization of ancient Rome. And later, he wrote about Hitler's Mein Kampf. I'm talking about Winston Sturgeo. He said, and I quote, is the new Quran of faith and war. Bombastic, tedious, formless, but full of its own message, end of quote. And not only Churchill, but also some social democrats, for instance in my country, admitted to the fact that national socialism was indeed at that time the new Islam. And my own personal great hero, we all have great heroes, one of my great heroes is Oriana Faraci. She said in New York in November 2005, the Quran is the Mein Kampf of a religion that aims to eliminate others, end of quote. And she said, the modern Islam does not exist. It does not exist because there is no difference between a good Islam and a bad Islam. There is Islam, and that is the end of it. Islam is the Quran and nothing other than the Quran. And the Quran, indeed, she said, is the mind of a religion that desires to eliminate others, non-Muslims, who are called infidel dogs and inferior creatures. Read the Quran, read that my Kampf yet again, in whatever version, and you will see the evil in which the sons of Allah against us and themselves have penetrated, come all from that book. End of quote. Very wise and true words. I am often asked how I deal with all the criticism and how I deal with all the threats. <coughs> and criticisms about my views on Islam, I have to be honest, they really do not bother me so much anymore. Because such criticisms are practically always uttered by those who have never read pages of the Quran, or for instance, the Iranian Islamic penal code. Criticism like that are more water of a duck's back to me. But, ladies and gentlemen, what penetrates my soul, what does and hurt, is when some people, politically correct, mostly, mostly leftist people, uh, call me or my party or my colleagues a racist or a fascist or a xenophobe or an extreme right winger or make uh, the most worst uh, comparisons uh, from the Second World War. Where Nazism and fascism destroyed freedom and democracy, I and my party are trying to strengthen freedom and democracy. We are trying to defend and to protect those fundamental aspects that threaten us. And the personal threats affect me, of course, every time. One never gets used to it, and one leads a totally different life. And in fact, by fighting for freedom in the process, you might lose your own freedom. But I'm not complaining. I have a mission. I have a very strong mission. And a lot of people in the Netherlands and around Europe support that mission. I do not complain about that, but I do complain about the fact that our government squanders our freedom by not standing up for freedom and by not standing up to Islam. Allow me some thoughts about the future of freedom and democracy in Europe. It's my opinion that wherever Islam arrives, decline sets in and elementary rights are threatened. Freedom and democracy lose ground, slowly but certainly lose ground as Islam gains influence in a society. Hammond describes, I hope you know Hammond, he wrote several books about it, he describes and predicts the following process. And I don't know if he's right, if he's right all the details, but I want to share them with you. He said, when the Muslim population in a country is about 5%, as is the case in some Western European countries, Muslims will exercise a disproportionate influence on society. And with the, with, with the percentage of Muslims rising slightly, they will demand that they do not have to comply as such with all the legislation of a country involved. And will, for instance, demand that in certain areas Sharia must be implemented. When the number of Muslims, he says, when they reach 10% of the population, massive lawlessness will develop amongst them with discrimination 
thought the original population was an excuse. Witness the riots in the Paris bad years we saw not so long ago. Non-Muslims in that stage who will utter criticism of Islam will be threatened at that stage. Once the percentage reaches 20 or more percent, churches and synagogues and will be occasionally attacked and sometimes even worse things will happen. And from 40% upwards, such is the case in Bosnia, for instance, and Lebanon, there will be widespread of butchery and continual terror. From 80% upwards, the state itself will be involved in all possible ways of cleansing. This is all according to Hammond. His analysis, whether true or wrong, does not bode well in for the future. Whether he is right or not, I don't know. But it is a fact that there is indeed no Islamic country in the world where freedom prevails, where there is a genuine democracy, where there is a real freedom of speech, where there is a constitutional state, where human rights indeed are respected. It's a matter of fact that the Islamic world trails behind the free West in every possible way, socially, economically, politically, scientifically, military, and let's go on. It's a good reason that people from Turkey, Morocco, Algeria, Iraq, and Afghanistan massively immigrate to the Netherlands, to France, to Sweden, and not the other way around. Ladies and gentlemen, it is regularly held against me, at least in the Netherlands by my political opponents, that although I identify the problems connected with the Islamization of the Netherlands, I fail to advance solutions to those problems. However, that is a false impression of the true state of affairs. I do have, and I do advance solutions, but those are not the solutions favored by the political elite. There are no solutions the political elite in the Netherlands and also in other countries want to hear. My political opponents believe that the problems associated with the Islamization and with mass immigration can be solved by entering only into dialogue with the self-appointed elite of the Islamic community, which, in fact, in the Netherlands, does not tend to be in good touch with the Islamic underclass, and by demanding minimal entry requirements for immigrants. And by giving room to Islam, they seek to solve the existing problems in our society. In fact, giving room to Islam is the worst thing they could have ever done. My solution to the problem is various. First, I want the immigration from Islamic countries to be stopped. Where I'm talking indeed about the non, <coughs> the not the immigration, and the non asylum immigration. If, for example, the gay Muslim from Iran is persecuted, he must of course be able to be granted asylum also in the Netherlands and in my country. Secondly, I advocate the support for all forms of voluntary repatriation to the countries of origin. I'm convinced that those honest measures at the end of the day will counteract, it's five minutes to twelve according to us, will counteract the Islamization of the Netherlands and Europe. And besides that, we believe, my party believes, that we should not allow more mosques to be built in the Netherlands. We should close down Islamic schools and we should outlaw the terrible book called the Quran. And some people may ask, is the Netherlands today still a free country? And I say, I have my doubts. It is not free when a minister of foreign affairs of the Netherlands calls on its maker not to show a film. It is not free when a democratically chosen people's representative runs the risk of being politically prosecuted, like I am today. It is not free when the minister of justice announces more stringent measures against blasphemy, which means freedom of speech. It is not free when an opinion poll reveals that many Dutch citizens do not dare, are afraid to speak out in public uh, against immigration, against the problems we have with Islam or other issues. It is not free when a Dutch cartoonist is arrested by 10 policemen and has to go to jail for 30 hours. It is not free when a Dutch photographer has to go into hiding in London 
for producing art photographers and is being threatened by Muslims. It is not free. When Muslims in the Netherlands complain about construction workers because they wear um, short trousers working in the blistering sun, it happened two weeks ago in the city of Lelystad in Holland. It's not free. When it happened one week ago, when uh, um, um, paintings um, um, that partially nude women are removed from a Dutch town hall because of Muslim complaints. They gave in. The Dutch government, often locally, but certainly the state government, did not only capitulate for Islam, but her behavior would be seen as a betrayal of our own culture. And I'm afraid that the Netherlands is indeed becoming less and less a country of freedom, and increasingly more a country of fear under the guise of tolerance. We sell away, we give away freedom, and we call it tolerance. I am convinced that this problem arises not only in the Netherlands, but also in the whole of Europe, in the whole of the Western world. And my conclusion, in fact, is that we have a lack of leadership. We have a lack of leadership in the free West. Leadership to defend our freedom. Leadership to defend our children. The political elites governing most of Western European countries are themselves governed by fear. Fear for facing the truth. Fear of letting go the still prevalent ideology of cultural relativism. Fear of fighting, fighting for freedom of speech, particularly when the message expresses an inconvenient truth or is delivered by somebody with a critical view on Islam. Our freedom, ladies and gentlemen, is very slowly but steadily being bargained away by the political elite. The ruling elite is afraid, ladies and gentlemen, of losing the growing support of the Islamic voters. They are afraid of the economical consequences of, for instance, the fight with Saudi Arabia or other countries. They are afraid, afraid of the economical consequences. They are afraid of being less popular with other Dini governments, leaders, and the European Council. It's not nice to be a Minister of Foreign Affairs and be tough on Islam if you have to go to the meeting of the Council of Ministers. You become unpopular and you don't get the most nice jobs, so you shut up and you sell away our freedom. And this is very sad because we know that fear is a very bad counselor. Rather than preserving our freedom, fear and political correctness will in the long term cost us our hard-won freedom. And respective, respectable democrat, democratic parties which aim to fight this concept of Islamization of our countries and of our West, and which aim to defend our freedoms, I believe will have to join forces to provide some counterweight. And I will be very happy to see that happening. If we are not prepared to defend our way of life, Europe will in the long term be transformed into indeed a Eurasia. And we owe it to our children to defend our freedom. As I said, we have to defend our way of life, our civilization, our culture. Part of our life is the separation of church and state. And nearly one year ago, the Dutch minister, minister of integration said that she even could envision a Dutch future where the culture is not only based on Christianity and Judaism, but also on Islam. And I called her, many people were angry with me, I called her the parliament insane. And I think <laughs> she was insane, and she still is insane. And of course, I'm not here to judge, and I will not say anything about Danish ministers, but I read an article about a minister saying something about judges wearing headscarves, and maybe they are from the same school. <laughs> Fortunately, Ladies and gentlemen, fortunately there is some hope. There is some hope for change. Not, unfortunately, with the political elite, but run by our constituents, our voters. There is some hope, at least in my country, where a growing number of Dutch citizens are getting annoyed with our government because it refuses to stop, to put a stop to the ever-advancing Islamization of our Dutch society. There is a tremendous gap, as I believe in very many countries, between the political elite and the Vox Populi. 
There is an enormous gap between those two. And it proves by, it's being proved by a recent poll, a recent representative poll, showed by a historical newspaper in the Netherlands, and it showed that no fewer than six out of ten, so a majority Dutch citizens, view Islam as a threat to our culture. While another six out of ten Dutch citizens, a majority again, said that mass immigration are the greatest political mistakes in the Netherlands um, since the Second World War when it comes to policy uh, decisions. And no less than 44% of the Dutch citizens from that same poll are the opinion that indeed Islamic ideology is there to destroy the Western civilization on the long run. The fears of those people deserve to be taken seriously by our government. And I plead with my heart and soul for the defense and the protection of our Western civilization. We will have to go all the way out to defend our freedom. And in saying this, I do not only advocate measures to stop immigration and to promote voluntary repatriation. It would also be worth a lot to me if more honest methods of history teaching could be applied in our education system and educating our children. We have to warn them from coming generation and convince them of the dangers that are facing us. Let us no longer be silent also in our schools about everything that has to do with integration and with immigration. Let us put the current mass immigration from the Islamic world into Europe in a historical perspective and assess what not only Mr. Wilders or other people say, but what they said tell about it themselves. Look at Mr. Erdogan, the current Prime Minister of Turkey. What is he saying? What did he say in the past about his own country, about the influence of Islam? He said, and I quote him, the minarets or mosques are our bayonets, the domes are our helmets, the mosques are our barracks, and the faithful our soldiers. And please, let those words of a ruling Prime Minister of a major Islamic country, let it sink in for a moment. We must, give, we must give our children an honest picture of the clash between civilization, the quest between West and Islam. Or, again, if you allow me to quote Wafa Sultan, how she said it, and she said it very strongly, but I do disagree with her. Wafa Sultan said, it is a clash between civilization and backwardness, between the civilized and the primitive, between barbarity and rationality. Let me wind up, ladies and gentlemen, by repeating what I said at the beginning of my talk. <coughs> Fitna, the title of my film, means ordeal or trial. And Islam, indeed, is the ordeal with which the West is faced. And Fitna, indeed, is a trial will test the extent in which we value our freedom of expression and our freedom of speech. And I truly, I truly do hope that the Netherlands, that Denmark, that other parts of Europe will be able to stand the test, will be able to stand this Vietnam. And in that spirit, let me end, you, end my speech by giving you my favorite quote from George Orwell who said, if liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. Thank you very much.